So while you're finding your seats, uh, I want to draw your attention to a series that the Henry Center has been publishing on our online periodical, Sapientia. Uh, we built this series in concert with uh, this weekend's conference. Uh, and in it, we're looking at figures that we're not examining uh, this weekend. Uh, figures like um, Herman Bavink, uh, Eberhard Jungel, um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, and the basic idea behind this series is we were doing the same thing that we're doing in the conference, except in 1,500 to 2,000 words. So they're, they're more like vignettes than the extended, uh, extended lectures we've been enjoying this weekend. All right, so if everyone has their coffee, uh, I think we will go ahead and get started. Let's get to Bart. So, Catherine Sondrager holds the William Mead Chair in Systematic Theology at Virginia Theological Seminary. Uh, she received her PhD from Brown University and wrote her dissertation on Karl Barth's dogmatic interpretation of Israel later published as uh, That Jesus Christ Was Born a Jew. She's the author of the widely acclaimed Systematic Theology, Volume 1, with Fortress Press, uh, the first of a multi-volume dogmatics uh, that aims to show, in her words, uh, that Holy Scripture could be seen as teaching and undergirding a full-throated metaphysical doctrine of God, that systematic work could be edifying and conceptually exacting that I might embolden others to do far greater works than these, and that the glorious beauty of Almighty God might be relished and praised within it. It is an honor to have her with us. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Catherine Sonderager. What a lovely introduction. I feel very welcomed and uh, supported, and this has been such a rich time for me here, and of course the papers this morning were superb, so I am looking forward to further reflection and conversation uh, in light of what Bart might bring to our discussions. The news from Karl Barth, it seems, is not good. The world of science appears to have no place at all in Barth's massive doctrine of creation, the entire third volume of the magisterial church dogmatics. Here is Barth's programmatic statement in the preface to his entire <coughs> treatment of creation. Barth writes, it will perhaps be asked in criticism why I have not tackled the obvious scientific question posed in this context of the doctrine of the work of the creator. It was my original belief that this would be necessary, but I later saw that there can be no scientific problems, objections, or aids in relation to what Holy Scripture and the Christian Church understand by the divine work of creation. Strong words. Now this seems final enough, even ominously so, but Bart actually reserves some stronger comments for a bit further on in the preface. The relevant task of dogmatics, he writes, has been found exclusively in repeating the saga of Genesis 1 and 2, and I have found this task far finer and more rewarding than all the dilettante entanglements in which I might otherwise have found myself. Then with an air of repenting a bit of the evil he intended, Bart appends an alluring sketch of the two complex realms we explore in this conference, theology and natural science. Bart writes, there is free scope for natural science beyond what theology describes as the work of the creator. 
and theology can and must move freely where science, which really is science and not secretly a pagan gnosis or religion, has its appointed limit. I am of the opinion, however, that future workers in the field of the Christian doctrine of creation will find many problems worth pondering in defining the point and manner of this twofold boundary. Now we might appoint ourselves some of these future workers in the field of Christian doctrine of creation and so might find ourselves perhaps especially attuned to the methodological comments Bart offers here for the complex boundary between theology and science. They do indeed appear a bit more hospitable to our endeavors here, a sliver of light perhaps, and might suggest themselves as the place to begin an expansion of Bart's doctrine of creation in a scientific age. But I would like, in fact, to begin our exploration of Bart's account of this matter a bit further back in his opening conviction, much firmer and more spirited and more challenging, that the proper doctrine of creation belongs not to dilettantish comments about natural science, but rather with extended reflection upon the opening chapters of Genesis, the saga of creation, as Bart styles these sections. These comments are infinitely more concrete than Bart's more general assessments of theology and science as intellectual fields. And concreteness is one of Bart's most reliable laudatory terms. And I think they offer us a clear point of departure for a proper Christian reflection on the absolute origin of all things in God. Bart in these early comments lays down two requirements for a proper Christian dogmatics. That the doctrine of creation concern itself principally with Holy Scripture and that this dogmatic exegesis be a free science, unrestricted but unaided too by scientific study of the cosmos. Bart adds richness to these points in his opening thesis statements to sections 40 and 41 of the third volume. Creation, he writes there, comes first in the series of works of the triune God and is thus the beginning of all things distinct from God himself. The history of this covenant is as much the goal of creation as creation itself is the beginning of this history. Now, however objective and metaphysical all this sounds on our ears, Bart is quick and quite firm to insist that the doctrine of creation is principally a doctrine of faith. Bart claims that everything we see in the world about us even its very external and stubborn material reality is an object of trusting belief. We receive this truth even as we receive and hold dear our belief in the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of heaven and earth. The doctrine of creation most basically is an articulus fide, as with the church, the sacraments, the atoning death of Christ for us and for our sake, as with the being and mercy and triunity of Almighty God himself, creation is the subject of Christian belief. Our world is no more an object of bare, neutral knowledge, Bart says, than is the kingly rule of Christ or his mighty resurrection from the dead. In truth, Bart 
radicalizes this common point. In the end, he argues, the proper and final answer to skepticism of all kinds, especially solipsism, that I alone am real in the universe, is to believe in God. The reality of the external world, everything from the singularity and the infinite expansion of the Big Bang to the most ordinary experience of a lecture hall and a lecturer, all these are confirmed to us, made reliable and the basis of a humane life by our belief in creation as the first way and work of Almighty God. Bart draws together faith and history succinctly. The purpose and meaning of creation, Bart says, is to make possible the history of God's covenant with humankind, which has its beginning, its center, and its culmination in Jesus Christ. The doctrine of creation then is thoroughly Christological and in just this way distinctly and inescapably historical. Thus, the schematic of the whole. But let me linger a moment right now on this little word historical as it will give shape to the contrast Bart draws with scientific accounts of the world. And even more, it chisels a sharp edge to what Bart means when he affirms creation as a work of God in the beginning. Bart adds a famous summary of this distinctive notion of history in the thesis statement I cited earlier. He writes, since creation contains in itself the beginning of time, its historical reality eludes all historical observation and account and can be expressed in the biblical creation narratives only in the form of pure saga. Notice here that Bart strives to say something that appears to exceed any human speech. He speaks of a history that escapes historical observation, a chronicle of real events that cannot be measured by ordinary instruments of empirical reality, and an unfolding narrative of earthly events that are genuine, historical, and real just because they are pure saga, not history or ordinary history, if we may use that phrase. Bart aims to develop a category here that expands our very notion of the real and the temporal. He believes that there are events in our world, indeed, the central revolutionary events in our world that take place according to their own free and glorious calculus and in their own sovereignty fashion an environment and objectivity and power and temporality that is all their own. They seize reality and bend it. <coughs> Sorry. this will be a good thing to do. All right, I'll try that again. They seize reality and bend it, a favorite image of Bart's, to their own ends. They do not break, but they do bend the laws of time, of materiality and of history. This odd term, saga, aims to do all that heavy work. Bart will make extensive use of this term once again in his doctrine of resurrection, a locus once more where divine revolution is 
inserted into our weary world, and the very notion of reality itself is exploded and made new. We might say in shorthand that Bart's use of saga extends and enriches his early insistence upon the eschatological character of divine incursions in the world. Creation and recreation, origin and consummation, divine freedom and divine presence, all these ways of God usward will escape any ordinary measure and will not take place according to our rules and habits and laws, but will rather in turn ground them all. Bart's doctrine of creation, that is, will follow the ancient pattern of the hexameron, a study of the six days of creation. It will characterize them as historical and as saga, and it will defend the whole as bearing down upon and caught up in the sovereign mystery of Jesus Christ. These are Bart's building blocks for an enormous, ambitious, and lengthy doctrine of creation, some 2,000 pages over four massive part volumes, and they will sustain a rich account of God's ways and works with creatures, apart from any scientific cosmology at all. Now, let me insert some distinctions here before unfolding what I consider remarkable and lasting about Barth's particular doctrine of creation. I want to draw a fine line between what I see Barth doing here, especially in his handling of time and of history, with what many Protestant academic theologians have done since the pioneering work of Friedrich Schleiermacher. In the Christian faith, Schleiermacher sought to ground religion in a sphere all its own, a state of being more primal and in its own realm more sovereign than any of the human dimensions that compose our everyday lives. In famous words, Schleiermacher early on tells us that piety is neither a doing nor a knowing, but a feeling, a lively sense of our own sheer dependence upon another. Now, we have had time in this conference for a fuller exposition of Schleiermacher's remarkable theology uh, and a much fuller exposition than I have time for here. So I will simply content myself with a sketch of the architectonic Schleiermacher erects for a world of religion and of science. Note that for Schleiermacher, religion occupies a sphere, a dimension of human existence that is marked off from all others. It stands as the still, immediate point between a world convulsed by action and reaction, by mastery and by searching, by undergoing and surviving and receiving what others will do to us. Schleiermacher was not himself chary of action or speaking or intellectual investigation, not a bit of it. He was a true cosmopolitan a disciple of the arts, of music, and poetry most especially, a translator of Platonic dialogues, an author himself of dialogues of high literary and conceptual distinction, a feminist and progressive thinker, a public intellectual, weighing in on the founding of universities and the distribution of their departments. He was an active churchman, preaching and lecturing constantly, it seems, and finding time in all this for deep friendships, deep loyalties to communities of all kinds. 
So Schleiermacher did not imagine that religion was a form of reaction or of defensive protection against the encroachment of secular learning. Rather, Schleiermacher knew that religious piety would enter into every field and would take on many forms of doing and of knowing, of ethical disciplines and intellectual arguments in every area of life. But, Schleiermacher warned, religion was none of these things at heart. Schleiermacher tells us that we are not in truth entering into the deepest core of religion when we compare doctrines or defend particular exegeses or dogmas or call upon the faithful to bear their cross or follow their Lord. No, Christian piety is instead an intense and rounded awareness a whole illuminated globe of inward dependence upon Christ, the source of all blessing and communion. Nothing can shape this. There is no teaching of the natural sciences, no discovery of the historians or archaeologists, no social or political analyses that can undermine or threaten or even rival the Christian religion, for it moves in its own sea. This supreme confidence gave Schleiermacher great freedom in his own historical work on the scriptures. It allowed him to read in the 19th century naturalists without hesitation. It showed him as, as a citizen of the modern intellectual world, fully embracing its discoveries and highest aims. But as with many freedoms, this one came at a cost. The essence of the Christian religion for Schleiermacher and for his many followers could not be found where the essence of the natural sciences of cosmology or of human philosophy or history lay. They occupied different worlds. There could be no competition because the players stood on separate fields, more on distinct and autonomous planes, and they did not speak the same original tongue. The Christian religion did not lay claim to the external world as a whole, nor to human civilization as a history and a task, these were forms of knowing and doing that by rights belonged to other human and human enterprises. Piety was the Christian homeland. Now, Schleiermacher has many disciples in our modern era. Those who consider science a realm apart. We might think of some of Stephen Jay Gould's work here, a separate magisterium or distinct terrain, as does Daniel Dennett with his perhaps ironic scientific, spiritual, and philosophical levels. All these are disciples of Schleiermacher's bold design. We often hear these days of readings that occupy different linguistic and conceptual rooms science in one, theology in another, or differing objects of investigation. These are non-aggression packs, if I may style them so, and they owe their conceptual armature, if not their larger spirit, to the pioneer, pioneering work of Schleiermacher's Christian faith. Now, it may seem that Bart too followed Schleiermacher's lead, at least in the setting apart of theology from scientific study. But here I think we want to be cautious. Not everything that sounds the same is the same. Bart has clearly signaled here that he is dispensing with a scientific cosmology 
and with a direct conversation or quarrel with astronomy, quantum mechanics, evolutionary biology. He thought at one time he may have had need to do so, but now knows nothing of the kind is needed or wanted. But here is where careful distinctions will come to our aid. Bard has something quite different in mind here than the separate realms of Schleiermacher's peace accord with science. Bard instead is laying claim to the whole of reality, the whole metaphysical and historical cosmos, and placing it under the sovereignty of the creator god of Genesis. Bart argues at length and with great technical sophistication that the world we and all scientists inhabit and study is a world of history, of pure saga in Bart's terms, and not of myth. That is the distinctive path Bart marks out as his own here. Bart shows little openness to segmenting reality. His willingness to speak of a two-sided border between theology and science does not, I think, violate this rule. And Bart does not, in the long exegesis in Church Dogmatics 3.1, seek a separate realm for this reading, nor a separate object to which that reading refers. Unlike much modernism in the field of religion and science, Bart does not hold that Christian theology refers to special domains within the world of creatures and of time. He was not one, for example, to speak of salvation history, as if that would refer to events marked off from the history of all other peoples and nations as they had experienced them and were known only to faith. No, Bart's conception of saga and of prehistory belong firmly to the one world we all inherit, and they characterize and explain the entire cosmos as creature, the free action of the free God. What the doctrine of creation undertakes in Bart's view is a recasting of the whole of reality under a relation, the God-world relation. And that, in Bart's judgment, expresses and enacts a form of history. We have arrived now at the fundamental conviction that governs Bart's entire doctrine of creation, really in truth his whole church dogmatics. So deep and lasting is this conviction that we can find it lodged in Bart's earliest essays and commentaries. Consider his remarks on history and historiography in his second letter to the Romans and we can trace its presence throughout the long course of the church dogmatics, announcing itself with noisy triumph in Bart's doctrine of reconciliation, the history of Christ's incarnation, passion, and victorious rising. The relation between Almighty God and his creatures belongs to a particular kind. It is not inert or timeless, not static or mechanical, but is rather the kind of relation we would call alive, a living, dynamic, unfolding relation between two subjects standing face to face, encountering one another across the infinite divide that is creator and creature. Such a relation is an event. It takes place over time, and in just this way has a narrative, a beginning and an ending. Simply said, the relation between God and creature is a history. Now this is a peculiar sort of history. 
Bart is very straightforward about that. One way to think about this unique form of narrative is to consider a human scale analogy, the analogy of friendship. This is obviously a relationship, one we call personal. A friend is someone we share our personal and private life with. It is not formal, as is a business partnership, say. It does not follow prescribed rules and patterns, as does a legally binding relation, such as employment. And it lays claim to our whole selves. If it is a deep and lasting friendship, as do few other ties in our lives. What grows up between two friends is what Bart would call history. It is not simply what takes place, a dinner shared, a trip together, an illness overcome, but is rather the elaborate exchange that is a life shared, the physical, emotional, social, and spiritual dynamism that knits lives together. Bart holds that creation is history in just this sense. And in that way, Bart takes his place among the prominent personalists of the interwar years. Now, all this must seem rather commonsensical and perhaps rather tame. But notice now what is missing here. There is no metaphysical fact of the matter about a personal relation of this kind. We cannot submit friendship to a medical or mechanical test to measure its presence or power. There is no object, single object, that is the friendship. We do not look for a particular thing and say, see, here is the friendship. We reserve the term symbol for an object that bears or represents, stands in for the complex reality that is a living relation between persons. A ring does this for many marriages. A gift often performs this service for a friendship. But the object is not the relation. Nothing is that. Nor does friendship follow a definition of the relation that governs and grounds all else. Friendship is not simply one thing, one relation, one pattern or event. Rather, it is legion. A rich friendship follows its own arc at times quiet companionship, at others an adventure or something a bit foolish, at times emotionally demanding or intense, a regret or anger, a sorrow perhaps, and at times a reliable source of rides to the bus station or back home again. The salient metaphysical point here is that a living relationship does not exist as a tertium quid, a third reality next to the partners in the relationship. Rather, it simply is the partners in this particular and concrete relation. Notice that this does not make the relationship irreal, not a bit of it. Not everything real is material or objective, nor is the real only measurable or substantial. Rather, the real may be a state of affairs. Marriage is real in just this sense. But it may also be simply two things in living relation, the happening between them that is their relation. Just so, Bart says, the very idea of creation and the covenant that will spring out of its midst is not a fact of the matter to be investigated or measured or tried, nor is it a feature 
or property of the cosmos to be picked out and examined per se. No creation-like covenant is simply the world, this world and all that is in it, in personal relation, living dynamism with the creator and lord of the covenant. It is a form of friendship in just this way, a history of encounter. Now, notice how strange such an encounter must be. We can imagine mutatis mutandis, a friendship that just is the history between two people. But we cannot, in truth, imagine a relation, an encounter, that is between the Lord God Almighty and a creature or every creature. One of the partners in this friendship escapes all our definitions and familiar understanding. Almighty God is Lord. It is, of course, true that God is himself invisible and immaterial. He is not seen among his creatures as they are, and his spirit is a relatio, a communion and friendship that just is God and expresses the love who is Father and Son in the Godhead. Nor should we imagine that the relation will be plainer or more comforting in the incarnate word, who is God visible among us. For we creatures experience him as Lord, as master of sea and wind, commander of demons and tormentors of every kind, a teacher, yes, but one who filled his disciples with fear and silenced his opponents so that none dared to ask him anything more. This, Emmanuel, offended us, offends us still. He is inconvenient to us, and his ways are strange. The cross is the name of the God-world relation under the conditions of sin. We are not friends of such a Lord, but rather his persecutors. The very odd relation between God and creatures, that is, does not spring only from the majesty and invisibility of Almighty God, though to be sure it concerns these, but it springs also, and most tragically, from the history that is ours, the primal rebellion that has its start, too, in paradise and follows us in every step from Eden to Golgotha and from there to the violence against God in every age. The history of encounter between God and creation is also a history of sin. The narratives of Genesis 1 and 2, then, do not stand alone. They comprise also Genesis 3. History, Bart tells us, begins in paradise, and in this very special sense, Bart would affirm the historicity of the events and figures of the Garden of Eden. But note this very special sense. This primal history unfolds the distinct and concrete relation between God and his creatures, and as such will be a history unmeasurable by scientific historiography. It will take place. It is an event, and it belongs to the realm of time, creaturely time. Bard is very firm about this. Departing from centuries of commentary tradition, Bart does not consider time a dimension created along with the other elements of the six days. Rather, he boldly affirms that creation is the first work of God, and it is done in time as the head of all the other works of the creator. This point, though, Surely a, a subtle, perhaps 
over subtle one on Bart's point, matters to Bart's program here because the world is never timeless, never an element in an eternal relation that is pure origin, say, or pure causal power. Rather, creation from its very start is temporal, the history of the encounter of the Lord with his servants. This history, then, will be told in unique forms and in a unique voice. It will be pure saga. For Barth, this term connotes a divinatory and poetic imagination, those are Barth's words, that speaks of what cannot properly or directly be spoken of. It tells what has taken place in the only idiom suitable for the task, an extraordinary diction of vivid detail, mighty works no one could witness, repetition and solemn cadence, narrative mastery and irony, all in a world readily recognizable as our own. No legendary beasts, no symbolic talismans, no dismemberment and birth of the gods, no just-so stories such as the symposium's androgyne. Rather, Genesis is saga as the history of our world, filled with the creatures we know, behaving under these remarkable conditions, yet in a way we consider realistic and timely. We do not look for some esoteric key that will unlock these narratives, nor do we expect that some conceptual secret lies behind these events, a riddle that is exploded and explained by adepts who have studied these mysteries. No, Genesis recounts creation as a story about God's creating the heavens and the earth and the beginning of the ways of the covenant with the human creatures he has made. Its meaning is its telling. And that makes it history, Bart says, the unfolding of events in time and in our world. Creation, then, cannot be a particular or formal relation. It cannot be, Bart says, a timeless connection or exchange. Creation, for example, cannot be simply causal. It cannot consist in an impersonal and atemporal relation such as that found in a prime mover and the moved or in a prime cause itself uncaused and the worldly effects. Creation cannot be simply dependence, as if the hallmark of the created order were a property, good now and always, that marked out the physical as the creature of the creator God. Nor could creation consist in a kind of spiritual effusion, uh, an inner light that is a spark from the great originary fire. Creation is not an inner metaphysical trait or essence that is handed over by or emanated from a vital source. No, creation is not a thing, not an object or property that belongs to the world, and most certainly, it is not a relation that timelessly establishes such a property. That is because in Bart's view, creation is saga and not myth. A myth, Bart says, parodies a saga. It appears to need telling, recounting, and appears to involve various living beings in relation to one another, and seems to concern the origin of the world we all inhabit. But in truth, Bart says, a myth only parodies these traits, 
In fact, it is none of these things. A myth takes many forms, and Bart often has in mind the cosmogonies of the ancient world, of Babylon, of Egypt, but also of Greece and Rome and of the Hellenizing Gnostics. But a myth can be altogether modern and scientific as well. The point in common here is that a myth relates a timeless relation. It does not take place, Kelsus said, but always is. Once we see this, Bart says, then the narrative elements of the mythos drop away, and we learn to see through them to these timeless truths, the primal cause, or primal fertility, or primal struggle that is cosmic light and darkness in the world from beginning to end. Nothing truly happens here, Bart says. We enter instead into a realm of eternal return, a timeless cycle where everything returns to its beginning and the structure of reality is laid bare. Now here we might ask, as our final question to put to Karl Barth's doctrine of creation, might science itself be a kind of mythos? Might it present a timeless, mythic relation of God to the world? Here it seems to me is the final contribution that Barth's theology might make to the work we have before us in our conference. What kind of science is proper partner to dogmatics? What kind of science is, in contrast, a pagan gnosis, as Bart put this point in his opening remarks in the preface to volume three of the Church Dogmatics? Could we see the complex relation between theology and science ordered by a form that is itself a kind of history, a kind of saga that is not timeless, but very much temporal and concrete and anchored in this world of covenant and of reconciliation. What would that look like? I think we can all imagine in one way a science that has become mythic or pagan in Bart's eyes. That is the science we have learned to call scientism, the timeless conviction that there is no God to create a world and that science alone measures the reality that is left. I think Bart would consider such covert forms of secular philosophy a kind of mythos where the conceptual truth to be learned in the world is that we are here alone, and that this infinitely expanding universe will one day dissipate and annihilate itself, even as it began spontaneously and without purpose. This part called a worldview, and such scientific worldviews could not find a friendship with theology because it is a secret dogmatism all its own. But might there be another form of astronomy and cosmology and biology that could exist fruitfully along the border of this world of saga and of time? I believe that there might be, though I think that this would have to be speculative on my part. Such a scientific account of the world would not simply tolerate theology or exist with it side by side without jostling or rivalry, but would rather be a companion to the world that has encountered its Lord. Its concerns would be for all physical realities, quanta as well as the very great, complex mysteries that inhabit deep space. That is, such a science would find room for medium-sized objects, 
for groups and herds, for flocks and families, if only for the emergent or upper level objects that compose a Newtonian world. And it would lay out its theories with a place for temporality, not simply the B series and its tenseless relation of before and after, but a genuine openness to the A series, the world built up from the past, present, and future. Such natural sciences would study the world we all inhabit. It would be neither reductive nor hostile to the world of purpose and of covenant that makes human history humane. It too would honor the inwardness of the human species and its scientists as well, such that the natural sciences would make sense of the world conscious beings such as ourselves order and undergo. It would be no more amoral than it would be atemporal, but would instead be the intellectual work and discovery of life forms who also stand before their Lord and Maker, moral and historical beings all. These sciences would not study or produce saga or even history in the ordinary sense, but they would be fields that could underwrite or prepare for a historical reality of the kind dogmatics knows. Even as creation is the external ground of covenant, so such sciences would be the deep structure and dynamism of the material and cultural world we see before us. Perhaps such a science could be, and perhaps, uh, indeed I am bold enough to hope this, it is the only science that ever has been. There is one world and one truth, and the Lord God of all creation is the origin, the ratio, and the scientia of all that is. Such is the science I believe Bart would have welcomed, and such is the science that is the glory of the real. And in just this way, the glory of the most real God, who is the one creator of heaven and of earth. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Kate, for that rich reflection. Uh, we did start five minutes late, so we do have a couple moments for questions. Uh, and we have uh, graduate fellows running mics, so if you have a question, uh, raise your hand and we'll get a mic to you. So I might start real quick. Um, mm, please. Bart's insistence on the eventfulness of Genesis 1 through 3. Um, it seems to rule out readings of, say, the fall that would see Genesis 3 as recounting a timeless theological truth along the lines of humanity is broken and needs to find our way back to God. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's something about the unique characteristic of ev the event of mm -hmm. the fall as happening within creaturely time that seems yeah. to be important for Bart. Yeah. So what's yeah, theologically at stake in that insistence? I, th um, I think you've given such a, a perfect example of the distinction I think Bart is aiming for in, when he talks about the difference between myth and saga. I think he has in mind here that uh, what a myth does uh, is just what you were saying in your first example. It looks for a tenseless and timeless relation that always holds between um, two or more realities. And it is the riddle or secret that stands behind some kind of narrative. Now, I, I think often uh, Bart has 
unnamed opponents in, in view in examples like this. He has a long discussion about Gilgamesh there. But I think actually he's thinking of uh, somebody closer to Boltmann or Tillich there, where um, we're looking at religion as a kind of explanation, a timeless explanation that can be expressed in historical symbols. That's helpful. Yeah, thank you. Questions? Yes. Hi. Um, so with this paper and what you're <coughs> positing um, in terms of what science should be, there seems to be a lot of room and desire for a dialogue and interaction between theology and science. And that's yeah. incredible and amazing. But we do see that a lot of what we see done in science today does kind of presume a sort of naturalism um, and a, a lack of, uh, it's much t more timeless and atemporal. So how would we as theologians, um, how should we try to enter into discussions with science um, when science isn't being operated in this way? Yeah, that's a, a lovely question. And I, um, you know, it does seem to me that uh, there are uh, mythic dimensions in some of the scientific fields that, that I've read a bit more in, in uh, philosophy of mind, say, uh, or in some forms of uh, quantum mechanics. And probably, I, I think uh, Kevin is, is quite right that most of the um, things that we as theologians read are other philosophers or historians of science rather than scientists themselves. But, um, but I think often in those fields, uh, there is an assumption that the only form of time is the B-series, which is itself tenseless by, by definition, and thought, therefore, to be much more scientific, uh, and that the upper-level world of uh, what uh, Austin, J.L. Austin called the medium-sized dry goods, those, uh, these objects that we see here uh, in our midst are really just um, collations of quanta. Now those, I think, uh, Bart would say are mythic elements in a scientific account. And I don't see why uh, we as Christians, as theologians, uh, cannot uh, say it, in reply to this, um, there are uh, good reasons to look at the world that is narrated in Genesis, the world of plants and animals and uh, living beings, as ontologically and metaphysically significant in their own right, and that this is significant for um, population genetics, uh, for any kind of uh, field biology, that is uh, undermined by a, a constant focus on molecular biology and on quanta. Uh, so it seems to me that we can uh, say the world we inhabit and this world of the past, present, and future is reality, it's real, and that science needs to give an account of it that is not reductive or eliminative. And I think there are uh, good reasons in a, um, a self-referential sense to do this, because the scientists who themselves propose these reductive accounts are themselves um, fully conscious historical beings living in the A-series Newtonian world. Uh, but I think there's also, in addition to just to naming these things that deserve to be taken with scientific seriousness that we inhabit. There's also benefit to the larger realm of scientific study uh, that these uh, elements of what was the scientific world in the early modern period, the study of 
birds and animals and large flocks and the changes within those worlds are being lost in an eliminative account. All right. Will you thank me in joining Dr. Catherine Sondre? Thank you. Thank you.